Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Um, welcome. Everybody kind of showed up, which is fantastic. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Andy Yan, director of the City Program and uh, associate professor of professional practice in urban studies here at Simon Fraser University. It's a longer title, shorter paycheck. But that um, I'd like to begin with the acknowledgement that we are on the unceded indigenous land belonging to the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Salatouf nations. And I'd like to start our event with just a few announcements that uh, the SFU City Program Fall 2023 and Spring 2024 classes are now open for registration and we have some great classes forthcoming in areas from planning and zoning law to real estate development from the inside out taught by Michael Mortensen who may not be in this room but perhaps is online and that it's we're also going into classes from designing design guidelines to climate action and our latest is with the climate action certificate for those who are interested in uh, engaging perhaps the challenge of our time. And so that is our kind of quick blurb in, in, for the city program. And I'd like to start off with really an introduction. And really, he is perhaps an individual in Vancouver who does not need an introduction, but I will anyways, that over the 50 career, the 50 year career of Michael Geller, that he has been part of and bared witness to the rise of Vancouver as a city and region. That from a population in 1971 of 426,000 people, the city of Vancouver has grown 66% to, um, to over 700,000 people by 2022, so to give a context. But at the same time, there's also a parallel tale that our panel today is not only the city of Vancouver, but also perhaps the discussion of development in metropolitan Vancouver, that in this parallel tale, that if you just look at the growth of metropolitan Vancouver and exclude the population of the city of Vancouver and their population dynamics, the population of that region actually grew by 254%. So you see actually how this conversation is not only about real estate and development, but also about how we've grown as both a city and region. And so in that context, it's moving in towards perhaps what's happened already, but yet into the future, and how by 2050 that Metro Vancouver is projected to be at 3.8 million people, with really metropolitan Vancouver facing a million new neighbors in, light, in slightly over 25 years. And so tonight, it's about looking back as well as looking forward. And in tonight's lecture, we are looking at looking back and looking forward Vancouver's changing urban development landscape. And the format of tonight's talk is a presentation with Michael Geller and a, with, followed by three respondents with an opportunity with the audience to offer questions on Slido. And I hope that folks were able to, uh, to find the Slido application and to submit questions there. Um, and so uh, hopefully that that may work uh, or we'll do it the old fashioned way. And so from that, I'd like to perhaps give a quick reading of the bio, of a quick biography of our speaker tonight and a, a person who perhaps uh, doesn't need an introduction but I will anyways I will try that Michael Geller is an architect planner real estate consultant and property developer with five decades of experience in the public, private, and institutional sectors. Some of his notable projects have been to oversee the first phase of the south shore of the False Creek a lot while working for the CMHC, rezoning of the Steveston waterfront on behalf of BC Packers, planning and development of Deering Island in Southlands, the redevelopment of, West End, of the West End Bayshore property in Cole Harbor, and of course, university at Simon Fraser University Burnaby. I should note that just quickly looking at the statistics up at SFU uh, University, you did hit your targets. You reached every, you hit the target that you promised in terms of the population, Michael. In 2020, you said that there would be 13,000 people living at university, and there was exactly 13,000 people as of the 2021 census. So you, 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 you promised and you delivered. So. <laughs> 
And so from, 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 from that professional wealth of professional experiences, he's been recently involved with a smaller infill projects in West Vancouver, as well as serves as adjunct faculty at SFU Center for Sustainable Community Development. And he's a frequent commenter on issues with a, in, the, in, in the media, almost as much as I do, but that, that in, the, in, in, in any number of, 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 of avenues and media, and a great, uh, and a, also a former president of the Urban Development Institute and travels extensively. And of course, one of the, uh, one of the required urban stops on the internet about Vancouver and the world is of course, uh, Michael's uh, travel, world travel blog, which we can talk about later. And so I'd like to just uh, uh, bring Michael up to the floor and for his presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, we're jumping ahead. Okay, looks like we're going to have the first slide. Are you going to yep. hit a button so it's full screen? And Well, thank you very much, uh, those of you who came out tonight, and thank you to all of you who are watching us on a streaming. I suspect the people who are here will envy you because they know you have a bottle of wine in front of you, <laughs> and they don't. And you can get up and leave whenever you want without anyone noticing and they can't. But I want to thank, there's many friends in the audience. It's wonderful to see you. And I particularly want to thank those of you who've heard me speak before and yet you still came back again. That's very flattering. Um, I've been told I have far too many slides and I want to make sure there's plenty of time for conversation and questions. And so I'm going to get right into this. But uh, I will start off with why I wanted to give the talk. And um, you may not have noticed, but I'm getting old. And most of the people that I find I dialogue with and who are now taking on the responsibility of planning our cities and regions are obviously a lot younger than me. And it sometimes bothers me that they don't necessarily have the background that I grew up with and, uh, and others grew up with. And so what I thought we would do is have a conversation and that's why I'm so thrilled that Ray Spaxman agreed to participate in this evening because he, as you'll see, was somebody that I looked up to when I first came. And then Michael Epp and Zoe Brook, who are going to join me, and I think we're going to have a good conversation. So I have a lot of books about Vancouver, but reading books don't necessarily give you the true stories. You really do need to sometimes speak to the people who were involved. So I came here in 74 with CMHC and was here for three years, then went back to Toronto and Ottawa, but came back in 81 to join a private development company named NARAD. And uh, I got that position in part because Alvin NARAD was chair of BC Place and they were looking for a vice president of BC Place and I applied for that position. David Podmore got that job and, uh, and did a wonderful job, but I ended up working for Alvin's old company. Um, I did that for a couple of years until I helped put the, the firm into receivership. <laughs> and uh, I, I, most people get put out of business by receivers. In my case, it was the receivers who set me up. I did that for a number of years until 1999 when I went up to SFU and uh, spent six, seven years there, and then uh, took a year off, traveled with, uh, with my wife Sally, and then came back and have been active in planning and consulting and doing a few little developments. So everybody who gets older will appreciate this quotation by Mark Twain. Indeed, as I was putting this presentation together, I had to ask Ray, was it you who imposed this policy or was it Beasley? Because, and he said it was neither of us. <laughs> but uh, yes, when I arrived, Ray had just arrived the year before, and uh, he was brought in by team, which was led by Art Phillips, 
And it, with those of you who were here before 1973 will know he was a true antidote to Gerald Sutton Brown, who truly was an old-fashioned type of planner. And Ray was brought in because people knew from his experience in Toronto he could relate to the public. He appreciated the input of the public. He also was a person who could make change happen. And uh, although we never used the word sustainability, he understood that concept. And indeed, as I watched Ray over the years, I, and everybody in this room, some of whom worked closely with him, will appreciate that Ray truly transformed planning in Vancouver and in turn transformed the city. And many of the things that met, uh, certainly I, and I know other architects and planners hold dear, like having an interest and concern for urban design, thinking about neighborliness. These were all the things that Ray introduced us to. And I found this quote in one of somebody's book. They said, Ray said, yes, density, but not too much. And one of the things we will chat about tonight is when is it too much? And I think the notion of Vancouverism, and Trevor Body's here tonight, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly I think most of the people I speak to say Ray was really the person who introduced the concept of Vancouverism to Vancouver. Now, on the provincial scene, uh, things had also changed. Uh, Dave Barrett and the NDP had been elected after a long reign by the social credits and social credit, and uh, Dave often said, we may not be here for a long time, but we're here for a good time. And he introduced a lot of things that today we, we hold dear. The agricultural land reserve, a new approach to planning, and also he introduced rent control. And uh, that's been a very much a topic. I just want to note that when he brought it in, it was tied to inflation. And in the first year, it was a 10.5% allowable increase. One of the things that was interesting for me in reviewing some of the literature is that even back in 74, foreign investment in Vancouver was a concern. The other thing that was changing with government programs, for years, British architects came over here and built public housing projects with a high concentration of poor people. Bill Tehran came in as president of CMHC, and he said, I really question whether this is the way to go. And as a result, new programs came in. Um, yes, that's me. And uh, nonprofit community based organizations, municipal nonprofits, co ops, and they took the lead in the development of affordable housing with a lot of bucks from the federal government. And there were uh, programs developed by groups like Lions and Kiwanis and uh, Norm Jones, if you're watching, whenever you came to me with an application as a Jew, I could never turn down the Society for Christian Care of the Elderly. They got to build whatever they wanted, and indeed, they built a lot of projects. Uh, Roger Hughes was the architect for the Pacific Heights Co-op on the right, and whenever I drive by, I remind people that one of those old houses fell down when they were moved but I challenged them to figure out which one was rebuilt. CMHC funded a lot of housing, rental housing, but also ownership. Some of you may remember the AHOP program, which made housing available, provided it did not cost more than $47,000. And for that, you could buy a condo in the West End, or you could buy a single family house in Surrey, and I remember having to respond to a letter of complaint to the minister because someone had bought a house for 47,000 only to discover there weren't any doors on the closets. And we said, what's wrong with curtains? One day, please God, you'll be able to afford doors. <laughs> that was followed by a rental program. Even in those days, rental vacancy was low. CMHC rental programs really made delivered a lot of housing. And they also created a lot of jobs, which was an important objective. Now, I don't know how many of you know this book, uh, but Donald Gutstein wrote a book in 76 that really, I think, provoked a whole conversation about who is responsible. And when I read this book, it's as if it was written yesterday. 
Is it the feds, the province, the region, the developers, foreign buyers? Whose fault is it? One of the big topics when I arrived and when Ray arrived was the whole future of False Creek, uh, both the South Shore and also the North Shore. And people dreaded the thought that, God forbid, there'll be another West End built on the North Shore of False Creek. And had Gordon Price been active in those days, he would have said there's absolutely nothing wrong with the West End. And indeed, I think that's something we've all come to appreciate. I, uh, I got involved, uh, I was brought out here in part to play a role in the South Shore of Falls Creek and in going through all the newspaper clippings, uh, and Ray, you may remember this, uh, I didn't know uh, Craig Campbell, he was only 35, but he resigned because he said the South Shore of Falls Creek is the last place to be building housing, especially housing for families. But again, it's important, I think, to to reflect on this because it points out how different our attitudes are depending on the values of the day. Inner city living other than in the West End was not something that people aspire to. And it's interesting, I got the job as project manager in part because no one else in the office wanted to be associated with it. They thought it would be a failure and indeed, if you read the Vancouver Sun and look at the headlines, people thought it would be a failure, many people. And then one day Art Phillips announced that he and Carol Taylor were moving in. And I personally believe that actually changed the public perception that if they were going to live there and Doug Sutcliffe, the project manager, very respected, elegant gentleman was going to live there and some of the architects like Roger Hughes and others said they were going to live there, all of a sudden it became an acceptable place to live, and not only acceptable over time, a highly acclaimed place. And those of you who know it know that one of the features was trying to create a socioeconomic income mix with one-third low, one-third middle, one-third high income. Something we would love to do today, but obviously have challenges because of the absence of government programs. But there were non-market, rental, market rental, co-ops, condominiums. And uh, yes, it was low density, but it was deliberately low density in order to attract families with children. One thing that many people are not familiar with, though, is Art Phillips and the team behind it, Walter Hardwick, and Colleen has certainly followed in his tradition. There was a notion that this would become a sustainable community to the extent people would not rely on the private automobile. And Art Phillips wanted transit to be in place the day the very first residents moved in. And transit said, don't be silly. We can't afford to do that. And Art came to CMHC and he said, I would like us to subsidize BC Transit until the fare box is sufficient. How about a $5 per unit per month levy? And that was done, and so transit was in operation the first day. Now, that didn't mean people didn't have cars. They did have cars, and eventually a parkade had to be built. But I think this is an idea that I'd love to see implemented in some of the neighborhoods I see being developed in Maple Ridge and elsewhere, whole new communities with no transit. As some of you know, the city of Vancouver is now reviewing the future of the South Shore of Falls Creek. Leases are being renewed. Uh, if Robert Renger is watching us, he truly knows all of this. But the fact is, I think there are opportunities to redevelop and regenerate that community. But one of the significant things about the South Shore of Falls Creek is it set the stage for all of these other waterfront redevelopments in Vancouver and elsewhere around the region. And indeed, as Andy said at the beginning, this talk is not just about Vancouver, although I must admit I often find myself being very Vancouver-centric. It's important to think about the region. And back in 76, one of the livable region plans was very much a topic of discussion, looking at where new town centers might be built. Uh, one of the things that surprised me when reviewing the document was Port Coquitlam was identified. But I'm surprised Greg Moore didn't make that happen. But anyway, the uh, population projection was seen as around 30,000 people per year, and it almost was. 
And over the subsequent years, and Michael Epp will no doubt want to talk about this, a number of other livable region plans have been developed, and it's interesting to look at how they've changed. And certainly some of these people played major roles. <clears throat> now, uh, rental housing and the shortage of rental housing has been an issue in Vancouver since I, the day I arrived. Interestingly, one of the most successful programs after the old CCA depreciation program to deliver rental housing was one that was not actually intended to build purpose-built rental housing. That's the MERB program. The MERB program actually financed condominiums, strata title buildings, but there had to be a commitment to make it rental for a minimum of 15 years. And a lot of money was attracted to the MERB program because doctors and dentists could invest in these buildings and then write off um, the depreciated costs against their other income. And it may be that we have to look at something like that again if we can't find enough federal money like there was back in 81 when the CRISP program came along and many of the other programs as well. As Andy mentioned, in 83, I was involved in uh, working with BC Packers on the redevelopment of the Steveston waterfront. I first met Bob Ransford there, a name that's known to many of you. He was a reporter and wrote a story quoting me saying Dis this was going to be no Disneyland. Um, but one of the things that uh, was so interesting is we were promoting quite a lot of density and we went to see Harold Steves. Uh, Craig Waddell and I, we drove up in his Porsche. We were both wearing Navy suits and shiny sh shoes, and we stood in Harold Steve's front yard covered in cow shit. And I said, I don't think we, we're dressed properly for this meeting. And we went in, and we unrailed our plans, and Harold Steve's looked at me, and he said, why don't you have more units? I said, are you being facetious? No, he said, I'm being serious. And I said, well, why do you think we should have more units? Because if we can get enough population down here, we can bring back the old interurban line to Richmond. <clears throat> An interesting perspective. Oh, one other thing about this project. Uh, <clears throat> Richmond Council had to refer it to Metro or the GVRD board for approval because we were redeveloping industrial land into residential. GVRD turned it down, and so Bill Ritchie, the Provincial Minister of Municipal Affairs, had a solution for that. He removed the metro planning function. <laughs> At the same time, BC Place was getting going under the directorship of David Podmore, Stanley Kwok, and uh, Alvin Nayrod. And, uh, Eventually, they started to build some housing on the North Shore on 99-year land leases. And then something happened. Just look at those population numbers. Andy looked at my presentation and he said, it's, it's too long and you don't have enough data. <laughs> but as you'll see, you know, from 74 onwards, there was usually between 1.4%, 1.8% annual population increase, and then after Expo, it jumped to over 3% per annum. And of course, SkyTrain was going now, and it was starting to change the patterns of development. And so, something like this that had been planned for years, but had never happened, once SkyTrain was there, the new Westminster waterfront happened, and if you don't know this development, I think it's fantastic and it really is worth, worth uh, viewing. Um, around the same time, another conversation was starting to take place in Vancouver, and Ray may want to comment on this, but uh, the first view corridor studies were, were being prepared and, uh, and we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Gordon Price, you wanted to know if you had more hair there? You did have more hair. Gordon, of course, was a, a commentator very much on the at the time and uh, noted that this really was going to transform the city and the, uh, forever and evermore, and he was absolutely right. 
Li Ka-shing purchased those lands for 200, 320 million. Some of you may have seen a story in the Vancouver Sun today where Stanley Kwok was being quoted. Stanley was very much involved. And uh, I mean, it really is, I think, transformational. Ray, 89, you left, if I've got that right, after 16 years. And um, although I think it's fair to say the mayor and Ray didn't always agree on everything, I did want to write out what Gordon Campbell had to say about you when you left, because I think this is absolutely right. You led to changes in the city processes. You pr provided a real concern about urban design and the importance of controlling development and creating a high quality human scale environment. And those people who follow Ray regularly know he hasn't changed his views on most of those things. What many people don't know is after Ray left the city, he actually set up a consulting firm. And uh, the one study I remember was Wally. And people laughed at you when you talked about the idea that one day there'd be a major town center in Wally, a beautiful urban walkable neighborhood. And it turned out you're absolutely right. And my friend Charon Sati is going to make a lot of money because of that vision. By 1989, though, after Expo, of course, foreign investment was really coming in and uh, to the point that it was a national story. Another uh, local story was the fact that after working for two years uh, with Art Cowie and George Spedafore, after 26 nights of public hearing, the Council of Delta decided not to allow the Southlands development to proceed. And it took 30 years before George Hodges and Sean Hodgins and Century Holdings were able to get approval for a community that's certainly different somewhat from what we were proposing, but not dramatically. <clears throat> but back in Vancouver at the same time, we're now planning the waterfront, Nicole Harbor, the city developed a set of policy broadsheets. It set out all the key criteria that had to be met. 2.75 acres of park space for every new thousand residents, community centers, parks. And one of the things, one of the things that I really wanted to communicate is the reason I think I have trouble accepting some of the density in the new projects is the density for Coal Harbor was 2.75. FSR. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ba I, I, at the time, got hired by a Japanese company that had acquired the entire Western hotel chain. Um, I could spend an hour telling you about the process to come up with a plan for Bayshore, but it involved, at the end of the day, Arthur Erickson and Norm Hodson, Joost Bakker. Um, we had a number of ideas. I grew up in Blackpool on the seaside. There was a wonderful pier. I wanted a pier at the foot of Denman Street. As, and in return, we wanted approval to build a tower that would come out of the marina, which I'd seen somewhere. Um, Sean Rossiter pointed out that we lost that one. We also, though, had trouble getting approval because we didn't have enough park space. And I said, we're next to Stanley Park, for heaven's sake. That doesn't count, they said. We also had a problem because there was a question of how we were going to meet the 20% social housing requirement. I knew the CMHC federal housing programs were not long for this world. <clears throat> but eventually we did, um, no, excuse me here. <clears throat> While we didn't provide 2.75 acres of park space, we did provide two new city parks as part of that development. And when we talk about some of the new development that's happening, I think it's important to reflect on, are we providing the park? 1993 was a big year in the housing world because that was the year the Mulroney government decided to withdraw from social housing. <clears throat> and um, as a result of that, um, I worked out a deal with this gentleman, may he rest in peace. Um, sometimes strange bedfellows can have a lot of influence. And I said to Jim, we'd like to make a payment in lieu for the family housing at Bayshore rather than just leave the site fallow. 
and that'll help you get your Woodward's project going, and that's exactly what happened. But the seniors' housing was built through a life lease arrangement. This is a project, the Performing Arts Lodge. Michael Klassen knows a lot about it. I've never understood why it hasn't been replicated. It's a great concept. But I am proud of the, the way the Bayshore development turned out, and I'm waiting with interest to see what Terry Hui is going to do with it. <laughs> and of course, the rest of Coal Harbor, and again, these towers at an overall density of 2.75 acre uh, FSR. <clears throat> One of the things that many people don't appreciate is it was hard to get developers to build housing downtown. Yes, the West End had housing, but when you went to downtown south or the downtown district, there wasn't an interest. And so a zoning was created that basically bonused office development if you included some housing. A four plus one. The irony is 20 years later, some of these buildings got converted to 100% housing. One of uh, VLC properties, planned communities that I think turned out to be very successful, Collingwood Village. And by this time, I was up at SFU. I used to pick up students hitchhiking, and they used to tell me they hated what we were doing. And I said, why? Because they said, it's a bunch of condos, students can't live here. I said, where do you live now? They lived in basement suites. I said, we're not building any houses. There won't be any basement suites. But it gave me the idea, why couldn't you have the equivalent of a basement suite in an apartment, like a lock-off, similar to resort accommodation? Burnaby Council, thanks again to Robert Renger and uh, the mayor approved the concept, and now I see this idea being pursued, and I think it's a, a wonderful idea. Shortly thereafter, Vancouver legalized basement suites. I'm sure it's hard for people to believe. It wasn't until 2004 they were legalized. But now that they were legalized, I questioned, why can't we have basement suites in duplexes? For many, many years, Vancouver wouldn't allow basement suites in duplexes. Why couldn't we have them in townhouses? Why couldn't they be sold? And I predict that the next time that Zoe Brooke is up here the, as the keynote speaker, basement suites will be sold all over the region. There'll be basement suites and townhouses and duplexes and, and all sorts of alternatives. Many of you will remember eco-density. I often thought that Sam Sullivan was a brilliant man who was treated badly over this but I admire greatly what he continues to do to provoke people and to provoke and promote conversations about the city. Uh, Sam didn't run. Peter Ladner decided to run for mayor. He asked me to run, and I won't dwell on the election of 2008. But thanks, Margo, for being my campaign manager, and Chuck, thank you for being my bag man. <laughs> But during the election, Gregor promised to end homelessness, and I mentioned to Peter I did my thesis in 1971 on an idea of setting up modular housing on vacant land that could be done quickly and inexpensively. And as a result of that, BC Housing allowed me to do a study, and uh, that one might say the rest is history. It took a while before the idea was adopted, but certainly now it is being. <clears throat> The other idea that many of us were promoting, laneway housing, was finally got approved in, around this time. And, uh, and the issue, of course, was that they had to be rental. You had to have a lane, um, and they had to fit in. I questioned whether or not the way the program was being designed was going to work. I think it's worked very, very well, and of course, it's going to continue. One program that Vision Vancouver experimented was STIR, short-term, not short-term rentals, a short-term incentive for rental. <clears throat> and it worked very well. One thing that the mayor did, which very few people seem to have remembered, was a task force looking at different ways to create more affordable housing in Vancouver. <clears throat> this was an excellent piece of work. Many of the things that came out of it, I think we would agree with. But sadly, it took a long time for a lot of the ideas to ever reach fruition. 
Uh, I chaired a little committee that included architects and planners looking at what design changes and zoning changes might make it easier. One of the things they pointed out, though, was so often they were having a hard time creating affordable housing because you comply with what the planners want, but the engineers didn't like it, or the sustainability office didn't like it, or the landscape architect didn't like it. And they said, what we need is an ombudsperson inside City Hall to adjudicate this. So Ken Sim, if you're listening to this, that's an idea that I think still has currency. But one idea that did get followed up was the idea of creating a municipal development corporation. This wasn't the first. Vancouver had one in 1976. But this one has carried out a number of projects. Around this time, too, we started to see these local area plans. One in Marple, the community was quite opposed to it. And for whatever reason, the amount of development that was contemplated hasn't really happened. But the Grandview Woodland Community Plan, I think, really has worked. And in doing a little bit of research, Brian Palmquist observed that it has taken far more of its share of growth in the city than most other neighborhoods. The Canby Corridor, I don't need to talk to you about the Canby Corridor. I actually think it's turned out extremely well. But there's one thing that bothers me immensely, and that is there's 30 or 40 rezonings generally in accordance with a very well-crafted, detailed, overall local area plan. And yet every one of those projects has to come forward as a rezoning and take two years and demand a lot of staff and council time because the way the Vancouver Charter was drafted, the city cannot charge community amenity contributions unless it's a rezoning. That's obviously something that has to change. Of course, one of the other areas that has been transformed is Southeast Falls Creek. I had concerns about the way it was being marketed and the way the developer was treated, but there's no doubt that this has become, I think, one of the most successful neighborhoods, not just in Vancouver, but in North America. But we were having lots of discussion around that time, and Gordon Price will remember this, because I was of the opinion, and many others were, that the city was starting to encourage new developments that were larger than they should be just so it could collect the community amenity contributions. So we had a debate in this building <clears throat> on whether and what is, when is big too big. And of course, Raymond Louie and Brent Totteron said it was absolutely preposterous for me to suggest the city would allow finance to dictate form. Who's this young man? <laughs> you know. So Michael, I first came across Michael on the Sunshine Coast. And, uh, and then when he moved to uh, North Vancouver, he really started to make things happen. And uh, it's great to watch. And around the same time, another young player came onto the scene, Zoe Brook. And uh, Zoe joined Grosvenor. And of course, the rest is history there. But this was also the time of the local area plan that was developed for the downtown east side. Some of you were at the Urbanarium debate on this. Um, we looked at the plan in terms of what was proposed, and we looked at what actually has happened. This was proposed for Hastings and Maine. This is Hastings and Maine. I think it's absolutely essential that that 2014 local area plan be reconsidered to allow a broader mix of housing. As I said, would we ever allow a neighborhood not to have rental housing? Of course not. So why do we allow this neighborhood to prohibit condominiums? It's a mistake. One of the other programs that the city initiated, which I, I, I admired, was a character house program that allowed you to start to get more density if you retain not just heritage houses, but character houses. And, uh, Sadly, I think, I worry that some of the new initiatives may diminish the importance of keeping heritage. But uh, this was a good program. I was particularly fond of it because that top right-hand house was the first house that Sally and I bought in Vancouver. Over the last few years, throughout Metro, local area plans are being developed. 
and lots of conversations are taking place. I was approached by some colleagues at SFU uh, uh, three years ago. They were concerned about a proposal for a high rise at Broadway and Birch. I knew the area because we'd built an apartment uh, office across the street. And when I saw the plans, I agreed with them that while yes, it's going to build rental housing and some modern income rental housing, this building is out of scale. And I spoke out, and I sometimes wish I hadn't, but I'll never forget those people who responded to my concerns by saying, why should we be listening to your old-fashioned ideas? For one thing, you're going to be dead by the time this plan is implemented. And they're right. But I still cared, as do every one of you. Um, a few years ago, th those of you who know the shipyards know that this is probably one of the best urban developments in Metro. And I think Michael might tell us how that happened. But one of the other topics that I've been interested in for four decades was gentle density. Reusing uh, single family lots, putting in three units, four units. And uh, that year I put together a Christmas card of 12 gentle density ideas for the 12 days of Christmas. And I had to include the fifth day because I've never given a presentation where I haven't argued for the importance of fee simple row houses and urged the city of Vancouver engineers and others to change the rules to make it easier to build these. Because a lot of people want row houses, but they don't want to live in a condominium. So on the ninth day of Christmas, I just wanted to use this to showcase a development that Lisa Berg and Stephen Mikacic and others helped me get approval for in West Vancouver. Nine units on three lots, 150 people opposed it, either in writing or at the public hearing. It went on for three nights. But now that it's finished, of course, people are saying, we need more of this. The Broadway plan, I think, is something that needs some discussion. It's been approved, I know. But it doesn't have any requirements for park space, anything like 2.75 acres per thousand. And uh, it doesn't seem to have the sites for schools and community centers designated the way they were when we did Cold Harbor. One of the things that was brought to my attention was that the Broadway plan actually proposed the reef or allowed or zoned for the f or set out in the OCP the future redevelopment of Arbutus Walk. I'm so old, I remember when Arbutus Walk was developed as a model sustainable community with innovative mid-rise forms and a landscape spine. But if you check the Broadway plan, it can be redeveloped at 6 to 6.5. Similarly, just off of Broadway, you get this whole corridor, this what I'll call transition zone, where all these little duplexes and smaller, older apartment buildings can be rezoned. It's wonderful for the realtors. They're out there hustling people to do assemblies. I'm just, I just not sure. Just like I'm not sure about this building proposed at the end of Arbutus at Broadway, 11.4 FSR, um, by the same a developer who's doing Granville and Broadway. If you've been by there, there's a new building replacing the little bank. Um, the one thing I do admire about this is that TransLink is playing a role in the development, something I think they should have done 20 odd years ago when I was interviewed for their board. Another initiative that I appreciate is the fact that the city's looking at densification of the arterials. Finally, they did come up or agree with the idea of a transition zone. What I don't agree with, though, is all those people watching tonight who are praying that I'm going to say all of the single-family areas should be zoned for six-story rental. I'm absolutely opposed to that. I think that would be a mistake. But I certainly think the idea of density along the arterial, a little lower density along transition, and then the kind of general density that's being proposed is fine. 2022, Michael, I found a better picture of you. This is from a very, very, I would listen to this entire conversation that matters. I think it was Vancouver Sun that set it up with you and Jill Lackey and others. 
very good conversation. Michael is at Metro. Most of you, if you're just absorbed with Vancouver, don't care about the regional growth strategy, but believe me, those who are actively involved in Anmore and Port Moody and many other municipalities, especially if their property is not within the urban containment boundary, they're very interested in this. As we get near the end, some other recent initiatives that I think are going to pay great dividends. The Missing Middle Initiative. And I don't know how much you've studied it, but I think in, many have said it doesn't offer enough density. Look, I think it's going to happen incrementally. Sometimes if you want to succeed, you do these things. The only thing I'm concerned about is the fact that you don't have to provide any parking. Now this is troubling for me because I've spent four decades saying we should take our minimum parking requirements and make the maximum requirements, but I'm worried this is going to happen. <laughs> no, I'm not worried this is going to happen. What I'm worried about though is there isn't going to be enough space on the streets. It'll be fine for the first couple of developments, but then we'll have to rethink that. Earlier this year, Zoe Brooks set up her own development company. She found uh, Chuck has to come in as an advisor. Um, I think he's on a retainer. I don't know all the details. And of course, this summer, we finally approved a Vancouver plan. And if you haven't watched Ute Lee's video on why it's important or all his other videos, watch them. They are fantastic. I wanted to include this slide, but I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm going to leave it to others. So we now have the province, the city, promoting gentle density. I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. I'm not so sure, though, about the suggestion that we should get rid of all the view corridors just to make housing more affordable. It doesn't work that way, Your Worship. So now, let's finish off with a few thoughts on what might be some ideas to consider. I, I get troubled when I hear Teresa O'Donnell, the former director of planning, saying we have to have this density, otherwise we won't have affordable housing. Yes, higher, as somebody said, it's hard to have affordability without density, but density doesn't necessarily translate into affordability. There are other components in the cost of housing, construction, financing, soft costs. You have to appreciate all of these. Yes, land is important, but I mean, I know, I know, sometimes increasing density is wonderful people who own the land. It's good for realtors. It doesn't always translate into more affordability because developers buy land the way you buy salmon and meat. You buy it by the pound or the kilo. Most developers price land based on so much per square foot. Maybe it's $80 or $100 for a rental project and $230 for a condo project, and they multiply the allowable density. But what we can do, I think, is create affordable housing by intensifying existing properties, rental buildings, regenerating the old social housing projects. There are opportunities to build on parking lots, uh, public land for sure. I also think there's opportunities to mix housing with industry. And I know many people are shaking their heads saying that would be a terrible mistake. We need land for industry. I know. But when I look at some of these low density light industrial sites, I can't help but think how much housing you could put on the roofs of these buildings or on some of those parking lots. The next thing we have to do, and not one person disagrees with this, we have to improve our public transit network. And if I'm not sure if you know this book, The Historical Atlas of Vancouver. It's a fabulous book with great photographs. And uh, I found these maps of the old streetcar system and the old interurban system out to Chilliwack. Isn't it amazing that in 1910, we had this huge network of public transit, and today we don't? but hopefully in another 30 years we will. And so what we have to do, I think, is almost replicate the transit networks of yesteryear in new forms. Rapid bus systems, improved transit from the North Shore for sure. Uh, we, the sea bus is delightful, but it doesn't do the trick. And also up the Sea to Sky Highway. 
You just have to, I, I be working on Furry Creek. I occasionally drive up there in the morning and I watch this parade of headlights coming down from Squamish into Vancouver. I think we have to completely rethink how we finance growth. Yes, CACs are wonderful, and those of you who've been reading Dan Fumano in the Sun saw that yesterday council agreed to defer 50 odd million dollars in payments. The city has generated a lot of money, but the problem with CACs, in my opinion, is they burden the cost of the new housing. Now, some people say that's great, at least the taxpayers don't have to pay for it. But it's not great, because when a new unit comes in at $1,300 or $1,400 a foot, because of the CACs and all the DCLs and other, I believe it also brings up the cost of all the existing housing. Because that $850 a foot unit becomes a million, a thousand dollar a foot because it's still 30 or 40% less. Now, in order to do that, I think we should also rethink BC assessment. This may seem like a small detail. I think we should reward people who move into multiple housing forms, and if you want, let those who can afford larger single-family homes that demand more services pay a little bit more. And I use that picture on the left deliberately because that's my single family house in that picture. But I still think that that's the right thing to do. For years, I went around giving speeches about the, how inclusionary zoning, which requires a developer to build a certain percentage of affordable units in return for the right for, to build a higher density condo, was a great idea in the absence of senior government funding. But I'm now convinced by those who say, look, all you're doing is increasing the cost of the 80% of market units. And again, that has the effect of bringing up the price of all the resale housing. So what should we do? Well, we should go back and get the senior governments to fund, and we should go back and start funding growth the way we used to. OK. Most of you think these buildings are wonderful. Trevor's written about them. Uh, others, uh, they're interesting. But this is a case, when I grew up and studied planning, we were told you don't sell density. You can't sell density. We sell density. And so my question is, at a certain point, should we stop selling density? This is a tiny little detail that most of you may not be interested in, but any builders and architects will. We apply the same exiting requirements for a three-story building as we do to a 33-story building. And the reason a lot of those old little apartment buildings were built is they just have one central stair. And now that we have sprinklers and much better fireproof products, we shouldn't be requiring two exits. Trust me, if this change was made, it'd make it a lot easier to realize a lot of missing middle forms of housing. We need to strengthen the third sector. Again, I started off at CMHC funding the third sector, the nonprofits, and so forth. I think that that is the only way we're going to be able to afford, build truly affordable housing. You can give most developers free land. They can't build units that rent for $1,375 a month, let alone $375 a month. Now here's another idea. When I worked for CMHC, Bill Terron, the president, came into our office one day and said, how many units did we build last year? And we all said, it's about 230,000. He said, how many homes are there in Canada? We all looked at each other. We didn't know. We didn't think about all the existing homes. We just thought about the new ones. I think we need to start making better use of all the existing stock. There, this somebody has estimated uh, there's about 800,000 empty bedrooms. There's, uh, probably if we went around this room, we'd probably find 60 or 80 or 100 empty bedrooms. Now, none of us want to share them, I know. But there are people out there who would be willing to share. And there are a lot of people looking for affordable housing. And with the right kind of marriage, you could begin to create magic. I'm almost at the end. 
Many of you know, I think there's a great opportunity for manufactured housing. One of the reasons I believe it's timely now is I keep reading about the hundreds of thousands of additional units we're going to build every year. Our construction industry can't do it. But if we start to use more factory production, it requires different levels of skill. That could be a very effective way of building not just modular units on vacant land to be relocated, but high-rise buildings like this one I went to see in Brooklyn. This is a personal peeve. I thought, since I have the floor, to everybody at the city of Vancouver, you're one of the few municipalities that won't allow people to make balconies a little bit more functional by having retractable glass panels and not including the area of the balcony and the floor space ratio. Burnaby, Surrey, everybody else, Maple Ridge, Nanaimo, they're all doing it. Get onto it. Everybody who's experienced this kind of retractable glass, they, they say they love it. Um, it's just a way of making housing more livable, especially as units get smaller. And this is my birthday present to Ray Spaxman. Many, many years ago, Ray came out with this idea of an urbanarium, a building in Vancouver that would showcase planning, would foster conversation. I went to Singapore and I saw precisely what he was talking about. In Beijing, I saw precisely the same thing. I think we should try and make something like this happen. So that's it. I think the city has improved since I got here, but I'm starting to worry that the features that made this city so attractive are going to get lost. And so I hope I've given you something to think about, and now I look forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, Michael, for those thoughts and those provocations. Um, it's not 9 o'clock, but that we're actually on schedule. We're kind of slightly on schedule, and uh, thank you so much. And I also want to make sure to thank uh, the people who actually run the city program. Holly, Margaret, over there in the back. Uh, I'm just the pretty face who's a figurehead, and it's really Margaret and Holly who run the place. And I want to give a hand of applause over to those <laughs> folks making this happen. <laughs> And to make this evening kind of further happen, that Michael and I were kind of talking about, well, what's the best format to this in terms of providing these thoughts and provocations about the future and the, and the past of development? And I think the thought was not only to have him kind of give a talk, but then also to have some respondents. And from this discussion of respondents, we thought of a collection of established and emerging practitioners uh, from, from the history of Vancouver in, in terms of representing the kind of of experiences and the kind of perspectives that are occurring in uh, the worlds of housing and real estate development in metropolitan Vancouver. So to invite uh, to the panel a series of respondents to Michael's talk, I'd like to first introduce Ray Spaxman. I won't read everyone's bi extensive biographies, but to introduce, uh, bring Ray, Ray over to the uh, table here, that uh, Ray is an architect and planner with 60 years of international experience in planning and urban design before retiring in 2016 as director of, as the director of planning for the city of Vancouver. He has greatly, I think, helped transform and shape the city that we see before you. And the, another person I'd like to invite to the table is our second respondent, Zoe Brook. Zoe Brook is the principal uh, Brook Development Management, as you also saw in the presentation. Um, that Zoe is a full-spectrum development manager specializing in mixed-use transportation, transit-oriented projects in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, but she also chairs the Urban Land Institute, another great organization to, 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 to join up on, the Urban Land Institute's BC's Young Leaders Group. And thirdly, but not least, Michael Epp, Michael is the Director of Housing, Planning, and Development in Metro Vancouver. That uh, Michael, <laughs> from experiences not only in Seashell, but also this 
small town called New York City, small tiny little town there, I've heard it's a big thing, but that uh, he's, he is also uh, a, he is a land use and community planner and is leading the delivery of 2,000 new affordable homes across the region and advancing policies to ensure that 15% of new housing is affordable. So that, that is our, those are our respondents to Michael's talk today. And Michael will be chairing this, um, this, this panel. And afterwards, we'll have some moments to take some questions from Slido and maybe some possible mom, uh, questions from the floor. I see you, I, I, and I can imagine some, I see you, Trevor. And that, <laughs> and that we'll, we'll, we'll take that on uh, in the last uh, minutes of this presentation. But over to you, Michael. So, Ray, did I say anything that you agreed with? <laughs> I'm trying very hard to remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was terrific. You did a magnificent job. It's uh, exceptional what you can do. This guy has an amazing amount of energy, as we all know. It's not, I've not found it anywhere else. And when he does do his energetic thing, you're left speechless. So this is probably the end of my part of the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. No, come on. Come on. So his uh, emphasis is, uh, always has been on housing. The emphasis tonight has been on housing. And a very conscious, from a planning point of view, it's one element of everything that goes to make life enjoyable in the city. And so... I've always uh, thought that it's so important for everybody to be involved. That's both all the, all the individual people in society, but also the experts. What we tend to have going on all the time is a row going on between engineers and architects and developers and lawyers, and they're all arguing with each other. And it's good to have arguments, but it's not good if they go on forever and it becomes a sort of sickness. And so our city is suffering a lot, I think, from a lack of what I call the exposure of planning. And that's where urbanarium comes in, and I'll talk to that too. But part of that is, unless we bring in the community and show by example that we want to hear from every one of them, and for them to answer in their own way, with their own level of understanding, but with a genuine supply of honest information. Now, I used to think that that's what cities were about. I got in a lot of trouble um, when I came to Vancouver. I was naive, even naiver than I am now at that time. And I thought uh, we would go forward with the idea of presenting everything we did in a language that everybody could understand. So while our work was very complicated, we had a responsibility to try and make it accessible. And with that accessibility came the need for people to sit and discuss that in a way where they weren't fighting with each other because they disagreed with each other so badly. And that really still hasn't happened to this day. The urbanarium that has, has been created, and thanks for all the people who do all the energetic work there, but it never quite reached the point where I was interested which was basically, um, the urban area is not here just to show the city in model form. It's to be able to discuss why it is the way it is and always try to find the left and the right part of the argument. From a philosophical point of view, as a planner, I've always believed that you have to have an ability to see what's the worst thing that could happen and you have the requirement to see what the best thing is to happen. And you need to find the way you want to go towards that. And the other part of that that I have is that planning is not something you do in five-year, ten-year plans. It's something you have to do all the time. You have to be, and particularly today, the rate of change since I came, uh, what, is that 50 years or 60 years? 50 years ago. Uh, is so different. The climate is so different. The need for information is so important. We now have uh, international interests at heart. We have to be aware of uh, th things like um, climate change. It's so important to take that realistically, and it's not going to be solved overnight. It won't be solved with the first programs we come up with. It will only be solved if we keep on top of it. And with urban, with that goes emigration. 
So while we have this, all this local debate about density and number of people coming to live here, we don't have a debate about how many people can we actually accommodate. When I look back 50 years and I see the models, oh my goodness, if we're not careful, we'll have buildings over 400 feet here. And then it became 1,000 feet, which is now here, but it's 2,000 feet in other places. And you see all those wonderful models of cities that have now become three-dimensional. So they're becoming like anthills. And the reason is because we must accommodate more people. So the whole system of growth is opposed to what we need here. Human beings are overwhelming the earth, and we need to do something about it. Of course, we are locally, but we aren't locally, are we? Because we never have that discussion. And it's not there. In the urban area, it could be there. If you go and look at the exhibition at the museum right now, you'll see a very fascinating one called Ghetto. And I've not commented about it, I think it's terrible. It's a beautiful presentation now, it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars probably put together. And yet the message is one of persuasion and not of analysis. So what we need is more analysis. We need more continuity in planning. So that's where urban area comes in and that's where I come in with a, a, with a planning system that says we always need to have what I used to call with my planning staff was a, 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 a trumpet. A trumpet is a thing which is this shape, right? And at the present space, we know what we know and we're very confident about what we know and what we have. As, a, as we look ahead, we begin to see opportunities that are good and bad, depending who you are. And funnily enough, the person next door to you puts them in a different light. But we need to have that conversation going on all the time um, with different levels of participation, obviously, from people who want to take the time, but including all those evasive and difficult thoughts about what's going to happen when all the immigrants escaping from what's happening bad in the world want to come here, and we want them to come because we believe in growth. And then we have the dilemma of who is it we want? Are we going to do the opposite of um, colonialization and just take the best people and leave the other people to suffer? So there's all sorts of those sort of issues that make us human if we can deal with them somehow or another. Apart from that, I must say I'm very impressed with what I've just seen because of the energy. And if you could imagine the architect coming out of him but, and the plan coming out of him, if you imagine then the engineers getting involved and the doctors and the school teachers and all having a say that is considered to be legitimate because they have expertise that you may never have. I only have a limited level of expertise, but I do wish for planning processes that encourages that ability to communicate. So communication with everybody about everything is a big deal. Being right is something that's only known over time. Apart from that, um, I won't say anything else. For now. <laughs> well, Zoe, we wanted you to be here because you can share with us the conversations that the, the young ULI and your contemporaries, what you talk about and whether you, how different your attitudes are to ours. But maybe I can uh, let you uh, share some of your initial thoughts and then I'll have some questions for you as well. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be up here with all three of you, four of you. You too, Andy. Um, you know, there's, of course, so much conversation going on. And even in just the last few months in the world of planning and development, it feels like we've entered a little bit of a new paradigm in terms of all levels of government coming together and applying some more urgency to you know, what really is a housing crisis. Um, what already is and what may continue to be when we look at our immigration numbers. So I don't think I need to get into a macroeconomic summary of where we're at. Everybody knows about you know, immigration targets, interest rates, and um, employment, of course. But I think you know, my thoughts in the conversations aren't actually all that different. Um, after listening to your presentation, I consulted my crystal ball for the future and it had a lot to say. And there's quite a lot of alignment, actually, with, in particular, 
your recommendations for the future. At the end, you had your, I think, 9 or 12. Um, as well as what was happening in the 70s. I learned a lot about that. I wasn't around in the 70s, and I learned a lot uh, by reading your presentation. So um, I think when I think about the future and when I speak about the future with others, you know, there's sort of three main topics that I would want to talk about here. One of them is affordable housing, obviously, how we're going to make it happen. Another one that uh, wasn't talked about as much tonight, but it's about environmental performance of our buildings. Um, and as well, innovation for the speed of delivery. So those are kind of my three main topics, and I've got you know quite a lot to say about all of them. And you know, perhaps those points will come up naturally in conversation. But um, do you want me to yeah. touch on them now? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, we know that GST was just removed from rental um, a, li a little late when after it was you know proposed in 2015. So we'll take it. The elimination of GST is great. It's a little too little too late. And when I say it's too little, I mean that it, you know, it's going to make a difference in a lot of performance to get rental developed, but it's not going to solve the whole problem. So I think we do need additional provincial and municipal tax breaks and incentives. And overall, you know, more participation, as you mentioned, from, from the province and from higher levels of government in terms of funding, in terms of grants, um, in terms of incentives to get stuff developed. For instance, in Minneapolis, they have a program where if a rental building um, secures affordable housing for a period of 20 years, a portion of their property taxes goes right back to the building and subsidizes those affordable rents which means that the landlord remains whole. That's a great way for for-profit developers to provide affordable housing. I don't know how it's performing, but I actually think it's you know, something that can be looked at. Um, Victoria just voted to provide an optional tax break on the land lift in exchange for 10% affordable housing. I don't know if that's going to move the needle, but it will be, it will be interesting to watch. Um, and overall, you know, we need to increase the percentage of nonprofit development as a pretend percentage of the whole. Right now in Vancouver, there's only about 5% of development that's done by nonprofits, where if you look at really successful, livable and affordable cities like Vienna and others in Europe, they're about 40 to 60% of development is done by nonprofits. And so, of course, nonprofit development is by nature, you know, more feasible to be more affordable. So, um, I've got some thoughts on, you know, of course, how to do that. Um, and there's the, the rise of public, the, the rise again, I might say, of public housing authorities. There's been some news recently of Burnaby creating a public housing authority, as well as Surrey revitalizing theirs. And so it's interesting, I think, and, you know, in my opinion, it has to be done carefully and in a way that's going to absolutely empower and facilitate nonprofit development through the utilization of public land allocating funds collected through CACs and density bonus payments, and expediting the permit process. These housing authorities, you know, some of them are proposed to be arm's length um, or their own kind of development companies within municipalities. Not sure that's the right approach. They, I think, really should be facilitating the nonprofit housing groups to do their thing and do it faster. That's really, I think, what we need. Um, as well as creative financing, you know, there's lots around development fees right now, and perhaps there, I totally agree with Michael that there should be more of a sharing of the burden. And this could be controversial, but you know, perhaps the naughty list municipalities you know, should take on a higher proportion of property taxes to incentivize their voter base to demand development from their governments and to support it. Um, and supply. Um, ultimately, we just need more supply. It won't create affordability, just like you said, with higher density. But if developers are going through the effort to create higher density, transit-oriented developments, let's you know increase the supply of those projects to the degree that's reasonable, and the market will dictate that. You know, we're not no one's going to build a 60-story tower where they can't absorb all those units. Um, so I think it will you know be fit to context in that way. Um, and so I think with, with that, I'll probably pass it on. I don't want to talk for too long. Um, and maybe I can pass it on to Michael, and, and I'll chime in again if, if yeah, the opportunity presents itself. Well, it will definitely present. <laughs> so 
So Michael, you moved from the municipal level to the metro level. So how different do you view all these topics that we're very much uh, interested in? Well, yeah, I guess I do have that dubious distinction of being the only government uh, public official on here, and I saw the sideways glance when we started talking about development fees a, a moment ago. So per perhaps we'll get into that, and perhaps uh, hopefully it won't be too much of a target. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to listen to your presentation, Michael, and to kind of think about those sort of broad strokes and uh, the, the sweep of time and uh, you know, how we've seen what's, what's been imagined at that regional level with the town centers and other things come to fruition. And those are things that only happen over that really broad sweep of 50-year time horizons that we're talking about with town centers being an idea on paper and uh, now being something and shipyards came up in conversation and some of those who are uh, integral to, to the development of the shipyards are, are here today. Uh, th those are the direct result of uh, vision at the regional scale. So our, our urban form would be quite different uh, without the Livable Region Strategic Plan and its uh, subsequent iteration. So it, it is quite different working at, uh, at the regional scale than at the, the local government scale. And what I find quite interesting and, and perhaps why this talk is, is particularly timely is I, I think we are in a moment where we're starting to reinvent uh, some of the pieces of, of how planning works in British Columbia. And I think we're doing that uh, in a reactive way and we're reacting to some pretty serious issues, uh, namely housing affordability is the main one. And we're seeing this all over, uh, all over North America. Uh, the, the, the trend or uh, you know, the, the piece of recognizing that housing is a collective action issue, can't be dealt with by individual municipalities. And you've got that principle in public policy <coughs> that uh, you know, the, the general should outweigh the specific. So you've got to deal with things at the correct scale. And I think there's been a recognition that California was perhaps uh, up first in this with, I think they've had over 100 different initiatives in terms of legislative changes that have been introduced that in some way curtail or change local authority with respect to housing. So we're seeing that now in British Columbia, we're seeing many different changes to, to how the planning system is going to work. And that is incredibly interesting and I think has a lot of uh, different ramifications for how we think about regional planning as we go forward uh, and, and the local planning piece. So I am watching those pieces quite uh, quite closely and my, my concern if there is one, I think largely it's positive that uh, there's alignment between every level of government and uh, we have uh, that, that move to try to drive to do something. But we have a, a system in, in British Columbia and I think Michael your, your example is kind of uh, get to this if we've been able to create some great things and we've been able to do that through flexibility uh, In some cases through painful processes and iterative processes that uh, that have played out and the system works because there are you know, consensus based uh, Processes there is that flexibility and we're starting to bolt on different pieces uh, to that system so I, I, I wonder about this moment and um, whether as we bolt on those pieces we're going to lose some of those other uh, things that have led to, to what we've been able to create here. So I, that resonated with me uh, through the talk and uh, relates to that, that regionalism approach, which is, I think, something uh, when you look around the world, I mean, our, our model's by no means perfect and uh, many criticisms have been levied, uh, but we, we have done integration of land use and transportation uh, better than, than most, if not uh, any other jurisdiction in, in North America. Housing is perhaps the uh, the question that I don't think we've quite landed, and we spent a lot of time in the presentation talking about. So, I think those are those are some of my initial thoughts. I, I hope I'm not the one who's doomed to repeat, uh, to, to use your your <coughs> quote at the beginning here. But I did learn uh, a <coughs> bit about some solutions I, I didn't know had been tried uh, previously. So, uh, <coughs> thank you very much for uh, for that okay. program. Well, don't leave the mic because I'm going to uh, ask you a question. As I mentioned, and I wasn't making this up. When the um, GVRD planning board rejected Richmond's proposed rezoning of the waterfront in Steveston and also objected to the Spedifor lands coming out of the ALR, that's when Bill Ritchie and the Socrate government actually removed a regional planning function. And while it's come back slowly, I mean, to a large degree, most people aren't really that conscious of a regional but one area where we are is when it comes to industrial land. You've been very outspoken about the need for industrial land. So I would like to point blank ask you, is the idea of allowing some mixing of residential and industrial land 
uh, something that we should just forget about, or is it an idea that you think might have some potential? Uh, certainly by no means my area of expertise, and I'm looking out into the audience at uh, Mr. Adernek, who is the, the author <laughs> of uh, many reports on this subject. And, uh, what, what I can say is, if you were to look at, and if, if I were in control of the slide deck, I would show you a map of the very few remaining slivers of industrial land that exist throughout the region. Um, and, and much of that land is in locations. Uh, you have water dependent uses, you've got uses that are dependent on the transportation system. It, it can't be easily replaced. So we are very concerned about the loss of, uh, of that land. There, there may be ways in certain instances and certain contexts to contemplate a greater mix of uses, but there's an inherent tension between residential use and, and even the lightest of industrial uses. And perhaps those properties, particularly the examples we saw, are underutilized. We have uh, some of the highest demand and lowest vacancy rates for industrial lands, I think, in, in any jurisdiction. So that there's an extreme pressure, and we will see those lands start to intensify. I don't know that, uh, that I think that housing is the right thing, and I could certainly say that, uh, you know, metro policy and, you know, point you again to, to the reports of Mr. Adernack uh, could expand on this in, in a lot of depth. Just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that residential replace industrial, simply be in addition to the industrial. So you would only be allowed to build residential if you built the maximum permitted amount of industrial. Also, I suspect, and I think this is fairly obvious, we're gonna start seeing more multi-story industrial buildings. I mean, it is amazing to see what we've got. Now, Zoe, um, I'm constantly attacked by abundant housing for saying it's old fashioned to be concerned about neighborhood character and worrying about the heights of buildings when we have a housing crisis. Like, don't you get it? So the question is, is that the sentiment that you think uh, is shared by many of the people you meet when you're at a young ULI leaders uh, breakfast? I don't think that neighborhood character is necessarily related to building heights because neighborhood character happens when you're on the street as a pedestrian and a building height, if a building is designed well with a good podium and a setback tower like we have many in Vancouver, becomes kind of irrelevant. You're not seeing the top of the building anyway. So in my opinion, I think that we should be building some taller towers with simple forms that lend themselves to great floor plans and investing in the character of the podiums at the ground plane. Having good fine grain retail, bringing in the existing neighborhood components into the materials um, and letting the, letting the tower be simple. Construction is so expensive. We can't be you know, creating Starkitect towers when we're trying to build rental housing. So I think there's beauty and simplicity and there's character at the ground plane. So my friend Gary Hiscox, who's sitting out in the audience, is just wanting to jump on and say, well, just a second. I mean, neighborhood character has to do with greenery and trees and open space. And if we're going to keep starting to build at six and eight FSR, regardless of the building height, we're going to lose those elements of character. So how would you respond to that? Ken Sim and ABC just put together a, I think, seven point plan. Um, just within the last week, it's been in the news. And part of that is looking to expedite local area plans to create, um, you know, smaller, kind of denser neighborhoods where buildings can be as tall as six stories or perhaps they go, you know, all the way down to um, duplexes. And um, I think that concentrating density around the transit corridors and really focusing on transit-oriented development is a great way to realistically match what we're building to the population density. Like Ray said, like the, there are the people we need, to, we need to build for them and we need to house them while allowing that gentler density and that lower density and, and existing buildings to stay where they are. Okay. So I think that, you know, those, that, ABC's plan, and I would like the six stories to be eight stories, 
Um, because if they're going to do it and they're going to push it through, I think that they just got to go for it and add a little bit more onto there because they're these little nodes that are going to get more applications and get more construction. Like, let's do it and let's, let's try and fit in as much as we reasonably can without, you know, compromising important things. So, Ray, you're not on Twitter, but you certainly follow the conversations that take place about uh, density versus character and so forth. And whether neighborliness is an outmoded notion, especially if you want to do a really beautiful building designed by a German architect on Alberni Street. So, so what are your true thoughts now that we can actually see you face to face about the way our buildings are being designed and our city is being designed? Well, I have to be very careful as um, I get sent back to Russia at some moment. <laughs> And the, the point of that, oh, sorry. The, it's a good question. To, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the, I think the architects are having a delightful time playing around with designs, trying to be different from the one next door, trying to be something that people go, oh, isn't that wonderful? Which is what I expect to see in an art gallery. Uh, it's nice to see some of the different shapes that are occurring um, in the downtown area, but it's interesting to observe those which actually seem to add to the quality of the overall shape of the city <coughs> and not just boast themselves in a funny shape, looking awkward and sometimes as if they're going to fall over. And so that's quite exciting for a sculptor to do that, but it's not exciting for an architect to do it. I'm also concerned that architects generally are losing the capacity to have a say in what happens because the budget is so important and the developer is so influential. And if I, if I pause there and you've seen my latest thing about uh, the influence of money on the design of the city, you'll know that yes, that's something we have to tackle. So uh, how do I feel about I like some of the buildings. I think some of them are awful. I think most of them are unnecessary. I think the desire to find a place for everybody is so important. So the street scenes you saw, showed of the downtown east side is very much the result of not planning continuously, which I said at the beginning. When I chaired the uh, local area plan for the downtown east side plan with the citizens that I fought very hard for the city to employ, we had citizens of every type on that committee. It was a com big committee. It was hard to organize it. It was difficult to be patient with the ones that everybody else disagreed with or you disagreed with. And so until we get that put together, uh, we will always have the homeless. We'll also have the, the people who are disadvantaged. But it does take a very big commitment on the part of government to put its hand in our pockets, which is where they get all the money from anyway, and do something for the poor and particularly as that number is increasing rapidly, as we still perpetuate the need for being the biggest and tallest and best building in the city, and the most one that's most striking. And if you look at some of them, and I have looked at some of them, it's even difficult to find your way into them. Um, and then when you're into them, you wonder where you're in a, in a housing development or an art gallery. And, and there's something about livability and neighborliness which is not being dealt with at, um, energetically enough. And when I say energetically, I talk to planners a lot about this because as uh, one of the things that I got to Michael to remove from his, uh, am I talking to him? No, him? no, no, he's uh, just telling me off. It's okay, uh, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's a big lad, I didn't want to wrestle with him. We was on. Well, you, 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 you see, I thought you considered it a badge of honor that you'd only been working for the city for about two months, and every day there was a newspaper story about somebody wanting to fire you. And yeah. you suggested that I should remove all those newspaper clippings about how people were trying to just placate you and help you stay on and keep working and well, not I wanted people get upset. To, I wanted people to believe that I was actually quite a nice guy. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's true that when I arrived, I came very naively believing in all the things I've just been talking about. And so, as a director of planning, I tried to tell people that's what I thought I should do. 
in fact, organized the department to actually say it. And my first report was called uh, Looking Forward to the Future or something like that. And um, it was secretly d distributed amongst the council with the note on it, this guy is too political. And I thought, I don't, I don't think I'm being political, I'm just talking about the facts as I see them. And so when I was told not to do it again, I said, I'm sorry, I can't run a department if I can't talk about what I believe in and encourage them to talk about what they believe in and do something about it. And I wasn't fired for 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> And I even did find a Jeff Lee story in which he apologized for suggesting that Ray was fired at the end, and in fact he wasn't. But uh, it's going to be quite a few years, Michael, before you get fired. I'd like to... Uh, <laughs> I'd like us to go back to this whole subject of yeah, financing growth. I mean, when I started in this business, we didn't have CACs, we didn't have DCLs, municipalities borrowed money or there was money from the federal government or there were bonds and they put in the roads and then they were paid off over 15 or 20 years and so forth. And do you think there's validity to this concern that by trying to get the 80% of market people to pay for the 20% affordable housing in an inclusionary zoning project or trying to get the developers and eventually the new homeowners to pay for growth through the DCCs and the CACs. Do you think there's validity to the fact that maybe it's time to stop that and go back to a way with a broader approach to financing growth? I, I had a feeling that you were perhaps going to ask me a question of that nature uh, tonight. So, so as everyone knows, there's been lots of conversation on this in the, in the media recently. And what, what, what is the best way to do it? Uh, we have a million new people to add to the region. Uh, we have $11 billion of infrastructure that Metro has to build in order to accommodate that. So those are the facts. It, uh, it has to be built. Uh, so how do you pay for it? And, and this is the question I think what you've put forward is perhaps that cost should be spread in a different way. I think part of the problem is in order to kind of peel that back, and, and I'll agree with the premise that uh, perhaps we need a different system of, uh, of funding municipalities in general. Uh, so you know, never mind DCCs, but look at municipalities getting eight cents on every tax dollar. And you know, if, if we've got these significant challenges that have been downloaded, maybe there's something there that, uh, that needs to get looked at uh, more generally. And I don't know what that answer is, whether it's transfer payments or you know, other, other ways of looking at taxation. But I will challenge the, the overall premise and we'll probably go down a somewhat wonkish path here if, uh, if I do this. But I'm gonna do it anyway because it's in, it's in the media on a regular basis. We're, we're having a lot of conversation about this. There's a really great report that I encourage everyone to take a look at uh, that the ULI has published. And there, there are a thousand uh, inclusionary housing programs in the United States, long history of uh, employing that technique in order to generate some affordability in, in market projects. And fully admit, this is not, it's one tool in the toolkit. There, we, we certainly should be using uh, a whole range of other tools, including many of the ones that were mentioned in the presentation. We need to get back into this from the, from the government sector uh, perspective, but I do think this is an important tool. So we've got a goal, uh, Metro Vancouver, 15% of new housing should be uh, meeting definitions of affordability when we build it. So how, how are we gonna do that? I think inclusionary housing has got to be part of that solution. Uh, lots of nuance, when, where, how. But when you look at this ULI report that, uh, that I'm mentioning, they, they take a look at those thousand programs. They've, they've got a team of economists and they're, they're looking at, well, what actually happens when, when you have an inclusionary program? And I know there's gonna be People who are gonna take umbrance with this and we can have some debate and happy to continue that debate afterwards. But generally what, what happens is the bid price of land goes down. So, so long as there is stability and consistency and a known, and so long as the ask is not so high that the uh, development becomes completely unfeasible and you would rather just keep the current use, that would be very damaging. But if you calibrate the program right, it should come off the price of land rather than get added to the price of units, which is something that uh, we've seen put forward and uh, there, are, there are many there. So there, I think that's a really active debate, but I think there's a lot of evidence that you can bring to the table that it comes off the price of the land. Now I would say with DCCs, that's also largely the case. If they're known in advance, 
uh, they should come off the price of land. I'm not going to say that they have zero impact on the overall uh, price of, uh, of development overall, but I, I think it is A, the most equitable, and, and B, the, uh, the, the, the best way in order to extract those fees rather than the alternative. The 11 billion still has to get paid. The alternative is you put that on general taxation, and now everyone is paying, including the property owners of existing rental housing who have to figure out how do I make my business work? I've got this new cost. So it, it's a conundrum, and there isn't an easy answer to it. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? So Please. I am not a planner. I am a developer. So I might not be understanding this, but our federal government's spending, what, $60 billion on servicing debt, and they've set these immigration targets. Like, Do you see a role for the federal government to participate in some of these larger infrastructure projects and in the $11 billion, it's a big number. Yeah, I should say they, they already do. So many of the infrastructure projects uh, seek uh, federal grants and funding. Uh, I do think we have a, a pretty historic uh, challenge here in the region. Well, that $11 billion we we're actually just talking about to be able to flush toilets and, uh, and do those kinds of very basic things. Uh, never mind you know, the types of transit systems that, uh, that were mentioned in the, in the presentation. So we need to be thinking a, a lot more about cities and the infrastructure that they require, whether that's housing, transit, et cetera. Uh, how we do that, I don't know. You know, many ideas that have been put forward. Uh, I think, you know, Michael, in your presentation, you had that at, at some point in time, there was a federal ministry that was in charge of, uh, of cities. Uh, uh, lots of countries do, do have that. So I think there does need to be a new focus to ensure that there's better alignment and upfront, ideally. Uh, between cities, the regions, and, uh, and the municipalities. But no question, this is one of those prickly challenges that, uh, that, that we have. Yeah. Well, rather than debate it, I think Andy has a question from someone in the audience. Um, well, he's from the internet, and uh, I think some wonderful themes for perhaps future city program talks on the intricacies of uh, finance to the challenges of development that uh, you can all listen to when you, when you join our newsletter and uh, come on over to sfu.ca slash city. So on that kind of uh, advertising note, because... Nice. Never stop the hustle. That um, it's very much, I think, uh, with apologies to the internet, we're just stuck with this type of format that I think the first um, question aside from shrink the slide and go on focus on the panel, that uh, the first question to get is actually, I think, one about uh, the post-pandemic city or also the post-pandemic region. That uh, what is the impact do you see in terms of growing vacancies in office spaces uh, that that have in have in the future development of Vancouver and perhaps it's also not only also Metro Vancouver, so I think that that's a question to the overall panel, including you, Michael. That uh, yeah. what's your view of a of the future of excess office space that could be occurring? Well, I'm going to let yeah, Michael. The real Michael answer that question because this is the sort of conversation he has in the office every day. We're creating all these new town centers with all these new office buildings. And uh, I don't know how the per they're performing relative to downtown Vancouver, but perhaps you can uh, comment on it. I, I actually don't have that data in my head either, but what I, what I can say, and, I, and we, we all know this in, in looking at uh, the articles on, on the topic. Uh, our, our region has fared better than, than others on, uh, on this topic. And I think the, the reason for that, uh, actually much better than others, if you were to compare to, say, New York City, where, where there are major crises in terms of you've got a downtown that's entirely based around office, the return to work is not going to happen in the same way. And what you've seen in those markets internationally is really entire asset classes are, are, are now irrelevant. Um, they are being... Uh, you know, deemed to no longer, they probably will never be occupied again, and that's the, the Class B and Class C office space. So there still is a demand for that, you know, premium Class A office space for certain companies in certain instances. I think Vancouver has fared better because of uh, the mix of uses that, that we've got, because of the activity that uh, we've been able to generate in, in some of these centers. So we are still seeing interest, but uh, certainly the pandemic has resulted in, in some changes. I think we will adjust. We probably will see uh, vacancy rates continue to, to, you know, my crystal ball is as good as anyone else's, but I, I think vacancy rates are uh, gonna continue to be elevated. And, and hopefully we'll see some adaptive reuse, we'll see some redevelopment and other things. And I think we'll be able to weather those changes in Vancouver far better uh, than other places. And, and I think part of that is uh, you know, our, our unique mix of uses and, uh, and the centers that we've got through the region. 
So Zoe, have you had any clients approach you because they want to look at converting their office building into residential or other uses? Or do you have other thoughts on this topic as well? I do have some thoughts on it. Um, office conversion is a really interesting topic and it's happening in Calgary where the municipality there is incentivizing uh, the conversion of, of the office buildings to residential through expedited permitting. And so um, my take on it is that, you know, we do have some older office buildings in Vancouver and right now we are in a snapshot of enhanced vacancy because we have several large AAA new office buildings coming on at the same time as tenants are downsizing their staff, firing people, or having people work from home. So I think that the snapshot in time that we're in now is kind of extreme, um, but it is a sign of the times. And, you know, I'm going to shift to short-term uh, rentals because at the provincial and federal level, they are becoming less and less allowable. Um, and if we do have some class B and class C office buildings, you know, I think that they could be a great contender for converting to hotel and converting to short-term rental. Um, they also might be a good way for an adventurous developer to get a bigger floor plate, but um, other policies and bylaws like the angle of light coming into a unit, um, as well as, you know, bedroom light, that kind of thing might, might kind of get in the way. So if we're going to be doing conversions like that, there needs to be um, allowances in, in the other bylaws that do relate to floor plate size um, in order to make it happen. That could open a can of worms that the planners don't want to do. I don't know. But I think there's a great opportunity to do some short-term um, rental housing in, in these buildings. Well, that is an intriguing idea. Ray? Yeah, the, uh, the issue for me uh, involves, I agree with what the panelists are suggesting, but one of the things that occurs to me too is that we're going through a new revolutionary period. So the old systems or the ones we've got used to recently may well operate for a time, but they will need to adjust. And for example, the impact of automatic intelligence is going to be enormous in my judgment. And if I... One of the failures uh, of our society is that poor people, I don't mean poor in the sense of financially, uh, sit for hours on freeways, going back and forth, wasting life in cars to get to work. And so that whole question of work and where they do it and how they do it and where they live and why they live there is coming under a shift in my judgment. So it's a bit like a, a revolution now, that's only one revolution we're going to have to face because the other revolution is happening every morning we look in the newspaper about what's happening politically. And so, in fact, I actually go back all the way to the French Revolution and begin to compare many of the things that are happening here with the things that happened there <laughs> and why that happened. And that's, I get into a great deal of trouble from my dear wife uh, for raising this when we're having dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, it is on my mind because as a planner, I would have that over there on that great funnel of the trumpet saying, this could happen. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we want it? If we want it, how do we get there? And, and all this other stuff is very important for us now. And of course, the politicians who only come in for two or three years, only come in for two or three years, and I've had so many cases in my 16 years working for them of them saying, when it hasn't quite finished the work, uh, we have to finish the work because we promised we'd finish it. And so plans are finished and approved by political uh, energy, not necessarily by logical energy, uh, because the rewards come from achieving it. There's a wonderful article in today's paper about the, oh no, it was in your thing about um, uh, how, how many of the uh, promises were made by politicians? You know, the mayor said it would be dealt with in our time. This was homelessness. Yeah. It was going to be done in <clears throat> by three years' time from now. And of course, we're still waiting for that to happen. Yeah. And that's because we don't do continuous planning. We do jump, jump, jump. And as we get disappointed with the politicians who didn't jump enough last time, we have a, a new bunch with new promises that can't be proven. And there's another jump to happen. It's a bit like directors of planning these days. They've come in, 
I come in and fight with, what am I doing here? Because the politicians are going somewhere else. So unless you come in, as I did, with teen, and I came and we fell in love with each other. So for several years, we were in love with the ideas of what we were doing under teen. And for those people who know the teen program, it's still a valid program to be considered. Otherwise, I don't have an opinion about no. that. <laughs> <coughs> well, Ray, I, I have to ask you this because I think we're talking about, and, and I mean, there, there's a really interesting uh, editorial by David Madden about cities of the poly crisis, that we are in this kind of era of poly crises, whether it be climate action, whether it be refugees, whether it be economic, uh, economic um, polarization, that I, 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 I'm imagining that in your t tenure as planning director from 1973 to 1989, I think one also has to remember that that also is an era of tremendous economic change in, met in, in the city of Vancouver, not to mention Metro Vancouver, in terms of what was happening in the resource industry. This is also a period, in case you're curious about demography, is that this is actually a period of time that Vancouver actually lost population. Um, I have one a dear architectural mentor who talked about losing money selling real estate in Vancouver. So I, I, I'm curious in that experience in that period of Vancouver, that moment of a financial incredible, I would say financial crisis, but then the kind of tremendous industrial shifting that occurred in Vancouver, what could be perhaps drawn from those experiences? Well, what I draw from it is an extremely biased uh, position, of course, which is Go for it. It, it was to do with the fact that um, the programs that were being followed were to do with all those things that you know I love, which is the idea of neighborliness. Out of neighborliness came the design guidelines that led to the development shape of much of what we have in the city today, which is still criticized, but the new stuff is not following that. And in following it, it uh, achieved something that became unusual for us, internationally renowned, uh, with the idea of Vancouverism. Vancouverism is an example of that and is now being totally misinterpreted because we now have new, interpre uh, new uh, uh, visions called Vancouverism, which aren't like the old one at all. Uh, but if you look at that first one and the, it's some, of you, some of the things you mentioned in your presentation, those did lead to us being recognized for a very livable place. And that's what I'm after to a livable place. Hmm. All right, Trevor, we had a little huddle here. Yep. Yep. We Tell don't you. feel the evening will be complete unless Trevor Boddy, the renowned <laughs> architectural <laughs> critic and commentator, stands up and tells us what a bunch of fools we are and how we're completely missing the point. No, uh, Mike, get the cattle prod out, okay? <laughs> uh, you, you've only covered two-thirds of your dossier of life. You did a really good job with the planner, Michael Geller. Uh, uh, your clipping service is superb. You've got um, a Victoria, and it was great uh, to have that historical collection. Similarly, you are a better-than-average middle-range UBI member uh, representing development uh, community, etc. 
Well, and your question, my, uh, and your question, <laughs> and your question. I, I'm asking him to be an architect because he follows travel. Say he loves buildings, he loves sculpture. He's got an eye. Yeah. But we didn't get any hints at tonight. So the the interesting thing is, I find as you drive up and down Canby, and I do drive up and down with my wife, who's here, and she will attest to this. I do say. What a disappointing building that one is. And uh, Foad Rafi, the architect, uh, and I did do the one building that, I, I illustrated one building, I didn't mention it, the Savoy near Queen Elizabeth Park, which I think did turn out a little bit better. It's certainly different than most of the others. The problem though, and I have a meeting at 11 o'clock on Friday with the planners to go through the design conditions for a building that is another, is that they're so rigorous about the setbacks and the heights and the rules and the regulations that if you try to deviate from it, it just adds another year and you still lose. Although Foad and I are working on another project for a full block between 27th and 28th, where we are going to try and see if we can creep above the six stories and do something a little more dramatic, and hopefully do something that's so beautiful that people who live in all those single family houses that are being sold, Michael, for twice what they're really worth because of the OCP, notwithstanding Jay Wallenberg and Coriolis' suggestion, that the CACs of $140 a foot buildable, that's right, will actually bring down the value of the land. But hopefully there will be a chance to do something that will attract people other than investors. And one of the biggest problems with the Canby Corridor up to now, to my mind, is so many of those buildings were not designed for people to actually buy a home and live in, but predominantly for investors. And thank God, that is, that is going to change. But, uh, no, housing, no, I mean, there was an idea that there would be all these CACs would be used to, to, to build affordable housing. There's one rental building that uh, uh, Mohammed Esfahani did, but they haven't built any of the others because they're using all this CAC money to, to fund other things. One of the reasons why a lot of those projects is, is, are, is de are delayed is because the municipal infrastructure isn't really there to accommodate all, all of these buildings. But the one thing that is interesting is virtually all of those buildings are generally around 2.5, 2.75 FSR. And so for me, you know, that's why there does seem to be a certain amount of green space. But this four-story box with a two-story little protrusion really needs to be rethought. I think we have enough enough of those. Uh, anyone from the panel to comment upon the Canby Corridor uh, around the issue of transit-oriented development? I don't really want to comment on the Canby Corridor, but uh, you know, as, a, as a planner rather than an architect, I just take um, umbrance on uh, the issue in, in general around urban design versus architecture. And just thinking about uh, my you know, former employer in, in City of North Vancouver, very few buildings in City of North Vancouver could you point to as being of any architectural significance or uh, you know, having that aesthetic value, and yet the, the sum is greater than, yes. than the whole of the parts. So I, I think the design at the neighborhood scale is, uh, is just as important, if not much more important than, the, than that individual building piece. But I'm gonna hold my tongue on the, on the Canby Corridor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're down to perhaps our last question. Uh, and the, this, this question is, I think, upon a theme that everyone has touched upon. Uh, about perhaps the, not only the city but also the post the post COVID city is really um, one about transit and how we've seen growth in Vancouver and its suburbs. We've seen a lot of massive growth in uh, in Vancouver and its suburbs. Yet transit, along with active transportation, still seems to be an afterthought. How can we finally change that? I think we want you to rephrase that question, Andy. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> Tra transit <laughs> we'll is an afterthought. Uh, well, 
I, I, this, this, is, this is an interesting thing because, of course, it hasn't, I mean, one perhaps, it hasn't been an afterthought that it's, I think, perhaps this uh, person, not me, just want to make sure that's clear, that uh, it's really, I think, one about perhaps also one, to, well, perhaps more along the question of active transportation, bicycling, uh, that, that, that bicycling, uh, walking, that um, how does that kind of disconnect? Because I think as professionals, they, there's been a lot of thought on active transportation, yeah. public transport, uh, transit, but yet uh, this particular question doesn't seem, seem to have yeah. that kind of response. And that seems to be a rather strange, maybe perhaps it's not the best question. Zoe, do you ride your bike to work? Not when it rains. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, we'll repeat online, but go for it. So for the internet's uh, benefit, uh, this is a question around experiences around the North Shore, particularly around the uh, North District of North Vancouver, one might add, not necessarily the wonderful things that happened at the city of North Vancouver, because that's just awesome, and uh, <laughs> perhaps some <laughs> challenges from West Vancouver, but perhaps also a kind of sub-regional question that is uh, rather than a regional question, that in the, in the sub-regional kind of part of the part of uh, the North Shore, it's perhaps a bit more challenging, mm -hmm. but a question towards that issue about okay. development and public transportation. So I would like to quickly respond just because on Monday morning I gave a talk at the K Meek Center in West Vancouver to about 150 ladies who are members of Probus talking about new forms of housing, alternative forms of housing and so forth, and all the questions were about transportation because we can't get out of we can't get across the bridges and so forth. What was my response? Well, I think we generally do agree that there has to be a new rapid transit link between the North Shore and the rest of the region. We cannot just simply rely on those two bridges and the sea bus. But the other question I raised is, will this be answered in part as more and more office space and other amenities are created on the North Shore so, so that people don't have to feel that they have to drive into Vancouver. Now, Ray, I understand you live in West Vancouver, and this is the first time you've been in Vancouver in how many uh, months? <laughs> 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, but on that question, this is a nice example. If you go to the urbanarium, you can't go there, can you? But if you go to the urbanarium, if you were able to go to the urbanarium, you would also notice that the problem that we're having is an inability to relate what growth actually means for every component of human behavior. Right. It's not just finding, oh, we put a station there, then we're going to have high rise. There's the sewers, there's the water, there's everything. A well-planned city will have that all drawn up. It'll all be connected. So when you say, we're going to put that there, you know that underneath it there's all sorts of stuff and people come and flow from it. And what do you do about that? So planning is the ability to put all that together into a system that will actually work. And there are very few city, cities, if any, that have achieved it perfectly, which is understandable, but there are some cities that screw up badly on it because they don't do it at all. And we're somewhere in between there, I suspect. But we don't have enough of that information to answer that gentleman's question, except that way. How do we go from planning to doing when it's something as expensive as building a rapid transit link to the North Shore, which has just been talked about? I, I assume it's been talked about for decades because it's been a conversation as long as I've been in the industry. What's, what, what's bridging the gap? Is it just a question of money? That's, that's all it is. It's all a question of attitude. And the attitude is, how are we going to spend the money that we can earn from 
the work we do, and how do we afford to do that through the economy, mm -hmm. and how do we select how that economy is going to be used. For example, um, I had a thing about exhibitions. The exhibition of the, uh, the, for the major developments in town are very expensive. Wonderful exhibitions of large-scale developments mm -hmm. that cost thousands of dollars of in time and skill in order to produce. If they were all combined into making an urbanarium available to everybody, that all the questions necessary would be answered honestly and not um, pre-written by the developers who are trying to prove that what they want to do is the best thing ever. Well, a good example of that just recently has been a debate about one of my favorite topics was view codes. <laughs> and uh, I will get now to the, the, the thing I worship, which is uh, the lions. Um, some of the production that oppose the lions take deliberate photographs of high tide in False Creek. So the boats are at the highest level and the masts stick up into the view cone. People say, well, what's the point of having a view cone if you don't protect it? Let's get rid of the view cone. I say, if you're going to have a view cone, protect it. It could become one of the major tourist attractions of this city that as you walk through this ever increasing density, wow, look over there. Those have been there thousands of years and they have a shape that no other place has. And are we going to get rid of that simply because somebody wants to squeeze another thousand square feet of office space? Well, <laughs> some great <laughs> questions. Th thank you. And, and very much the city program may or may not be having a wonderful lecture coming forthcoming on view cones. So uh, again, feel free to join our newsletter at uh, sfu.ca slash city. That, uh, thank you so much that we're at 9 o'clock, which represents the end of our program. And thank you so much. And, and please give a hand to Michael, uh, Michael Geller and our panel here for tonight's events. Thank you.